Humanity is able to travel through space in the year 10191 because of a valuable material known as spice, which is only found on the planet Arrakis. Nobles have come to the planet to conquer and control the supply of spices, therefore the inhabitants, known as freemen, are treated harshly by the empire. The Harkonnen family ruled Arrakis for a long time until the emperor expelled them, and the Atreides family assumed control. But the Harkonnens never stopped planning their retaliation, and in order to retake control of the planet, they finally launch an attack on Arrakis. With the exception of Paul, the boy, and his mother Jessica, who flee to the desert and meet the freemen, the majority of the Atreides family is slain. Jessica is a member of the Bean Gesserit, a group that has invented a prophecy in secret that leads some freemen to think Paul might be the chosen one who will deliver them from the empire. The freemen agree to bring them to their settlement when Paul proves himself in a fight. All other people in the cosmos, on the other hand, believe that the Atreides family has vanished. Vladimir, the head of the Harkonnen family, gives his nephew Rabin control over Arrakis's spice production as a reward for finishing the mission. Paul's company is in the desert when they hear some Harrison and soldiers being dropped by a spaceship, so they scramble to hide. They leave a corpse behind as bait, and a thumper starts yelling for the enormous worms as the soldiers approach. Hearing the sound, the Harkoners deduce the strategy and take off for the closest outcropping of rock. The sky turns dark due to an eclipse at that precise moment, giving the freemen the opportunity to fire their laser weapons at the soldiers from a distance. When a soldier descends to see how the fallen victims are doing, Paul quickly grabs a blade and engages in combat showcasing his impressive fighting prowess before dispatching him. Paul is suddenly surrounded by another soldier, but Jessica kills him with a rock right away. The freshmen take all the water out of the corpses after the fight. When Jessica vomit up out of the blue, everyone assumes she's appalled by what they see, but she's actually pregnant. The freemen then call for a gigantic worm to eat all of the soldiers' bodies that have been stacked up. Rabin is informed that they are losing too many men in freeman territory, and that he should relocate his tropes elsewhere in the interim. Rabin, enraged, screams that they are losing soldiers to rats, and starts beating up his aide. Paul's troop eventually makes it to the village of the freemen. While many are displeased to see Paul and are afraid of him, some of the locals submit to him because they think he is a prophet. When Stilger tries to persuade the council that Paul is the chosen one, they don't listen to him. Paul experiences an incomprehensible vision due to the spice in the meal that Jessica and he are still fed. Jessica is then summoned to see a rite in which water is taken from the warrior Paul murdered and added to a lake inside a cave. According to Stilger, Frieden constructed hundreds of these water caches to aid in the terraforming of the planet. He then discloses that their reverend mother is terminally ill, and they would like Jessica to step in for her. Jessica agrees to aid Paul by doing so. After being brought to a cave, the Reverend Mother rubs her face as the Freeman outside offer prayers. Subsequently, the Freeman offer her the water of life, narrating that the poison releases the soul, kills her, and enhances her vision. Jessica takes a sip, and the fetus inside her begins to shift instantly, causing her to go into convulsions. The Reverend Mother deems the ritual a mistake as her eyes turn blue, indicating that she is pregnant. There is a fight among the Freeman following the death of the Reverend Mother. Some believe that Jessica's pregnancy survival was a miracle, and that this validates the prophecy, while others believe that that the huge families are the ones who manufactured the falsehood and that their savior shouldn't be an outsider. Paul breaks up the dispute to clarify that it wasn't a miracle because his mother had been educated to withstand poisonings. In addition, he claims he just wants to fight alongside them and has no plans to take the lead, but Stilger is even more convinced of his selection because of his humility. Jessica tells Paul that the baby can now communicate with her, and that he should also drink the water when she wakes up. Paul receives a tend and some food later on in order to go around the desert and become familiar with the ways of the freemen. Though Paul isn't particularly good at it, he cautiously strolls on the sand. Chani joins him and helps him with technique, along with teaching him a lot about the desert and being a freeman, she also starts to become fond of him as they spend more time together. While in town, Jessica keeps conversing with her child and starts formulating plans to persuade the skeptics to change their thoughts. A harvester shows up in the desert a few days later to gather spices. The freemen launch a surprise attack from their hiding places in the sand killing several troops as they move deftly across the sand, giving them the upper hand. The freemen flee to hide beneath the harvester as the enemy's plane, which has now arrived, begins fire on them. Two more soldiers are brought out by Chani and Paul who then use Paul as bait to draw the aircraft's attention, before Chen uses her laser cannon to bring it down. It is now possible for more freemen to emerge from hiding fire at the harvester simultaneously and ultimately destroy it. That evening, the team celebrates their triumph and officially welcomes Paul to the freemen. As a formal welcome, they give him a warrior name and give him a hug. The following day, Paul removes his family ring and watches Stilger ride a worm, realizing he is no longer an Atreides. He is then joined by Chani and they kiss. The party travels together through the desert for the next few months, 
starts destroying any harvesters they come across and gradually causing significant losses to the Harkonnen house. Vladimir kills two of his assistants out of rage. After learning about all of these issues, he summons Rabin to his quarters and threatens to remove Spice from their control if they continue to fail. Rabin faces consequences if he doesn't make amends, coming full circle. Paul awakens from yet another nightmare. He tries to tell Chani about it, but he can't recall anything. He envisions himself going into battle with a woman while hundreds of people perish all around them. Chani informs him that strange dreams are simply a result of his prolonged exposure to spices. Paul then prepares for the Freeman's rite of passage, which is to call upon an rite of sandworm. Paul checks the sand in a few different locations before settling on the ideal location and dropping a thumper. A larger than normal worm soon arrives, but Paul is unfazed. He leaps on top of it, and uses some hooks to hang onto it before he tumbles off. After considerable effort, he finds his footing and attaches the hook to begin writing the worm correctly, earning Freeman's admiration. While everyone applauds him, some of them also bow since this fulfills a prophecy. Jessica gets the news swiftly and begs her followers to tell others about it. Paul chooses not to accompany her when she decides to go south to gain followers. She's the woman he's dreaming about, he realizes as he bids her farewell. Eventually, the Freeman attack a spice storage, destroying 80% of the enemy harvest. In a fit of rage, Rabin rallies his forces and takes to the skies to search for the Freeman. Rabin orders his soldiers to shoot down the rocky formation even though they are unable to see them anywhere. This results in a massive explosion and a dense dust cloud. The Freeman then have an opportunity to surround Rabin and his soldiers and start murdering them one by one as they set forth from their ships and start strolling through the fog. Fearful, Rabin and his men attempt to flee. But the Freeman also open fire on the plane. After a guard shoots the assailant off the ship, allowing Rabin to escape, he barely hangs on and nearly dies in the process. The Emperor, meantime, is concerned about the Freeman gaining strength, and Princess Ireland, his daughter, counsels him to allow the dispute to escalate into a full-scale confrontation. Ireland later confides in Reverend Mother Helen that she believes Paul to be the new prophet of the Freeman. Helen affirms it, but advises her not to inform anyone especially the Emperor because her father might lose the throne if the powerful houses learn about the Atreides family murder. She is also organizing Fade, the nephew of the Emperor, to assume control of Arrakis. Fade, incidentally, is preparing ready for a fight and tests his new blade on a servant killing her right away, but still grumbling about its sharpness. Simultaneously, his adversaries receive an enigmatic injection, revealing themselves to be three convicts belonging to the Adrids family. Then Fade walks into the arena, where thousands of spectators, including Vladimir, have gathered to see his birthday match. In a matter of seconds, he dispatches two out of his three opponents, nevertheless the third one, who was spared the poison, challenges him fairly. Fade knows he's being tested, so he shows off by taking off his bod shield and keeps fighting the prisoner while urging the guards not to assist him. Even though his opponent gives it his all, Fade is still a superior fighter, and the crowd cheers when Fade kills him as well. Fade confronts Vladimir later that day about the deception, and Vladimir responds by telling him he passed the test and is now eligible to have a ruckus. Vladimir goes on to say that he wants Fade to succeed him and that he intends to overthrow the Emperor. As he waits outside, he discovers that Margot, a Bean Gesserit member, is following him. Fade discovers that he has seen her in his nightmares, and Margot tricks him into going to her room where they both get messy. The following day, Margot tells Helen and Ireland that the lineage has been guaranteed as, as anticipated, she is expecting Fade's child. Vladimir appoints Fade as the new Arrakis governor concurrently. A group of smugglers uses a harvester to land in the desert in order to gather some spices. But the freemen quickly set off buried mines and open fire, destroying all of their gear. Paul charges at one of the smugglers, but he retreats when he sees that it's Gurney, the warmaster who was once employed by his family. Paul gives an embrace to his old friend and orders the others to stop attacking. Gurney and his men then begin traveling alongside Paul's gang. Gurney advises Paul to utilize his authority to subdue the freemen and exact revenge, but Paul is afraid to do so, since he believes that doing so will spark a holy war that claims millions of lives. Gurney later confesses to knowing the location of the Adreed's family's arsenal of weapons. Paul begins to see things differently because he believes that all that power will enable him to secure the freemen's independence. They proceed to the secret cave, where Paul's DNA is the only thing that can open the door. After after telling the others. They discover 92 atomic bombs within. Jessica travels to the south in the interim and keeps talking about Paul's accomplishments. She also meets with the Maker Keeper, who demonstrates to her the operation of the Water of Life. The Keeper calls forth a young sandworm within a temple, which she later drowns in a tiny lake in order to collect its poison. When the poison wears off, Jessica uses her influence to make the Keeper share the water with Paul when he arrives, even though it is against the rules. Paul sees Chani's scorched face when he finds her staring at the sun at some point later. He wakes up abruptly to find 
find all the freemen staring around, hearing explosions, Fae is attacking their village, knocking it down with powerful artillery fired from aircraft, it turns out, Rabin confronts his brother Fade for stepping in for him when he gets there, but Fade knocks him down fast and makes him kiss his feet, then Fade meets with Chani's friend who was taken prisoner during the attack, nevertheless, she is slain since she won't divulge any information, returning to Paul's group, they hasten to their hometown in order to assist the few survivors of the assault, the leaders are meeting to discuss the situation, according to a message from the south, but Paul won't go, since he can't face his visions, he experiences the same horrifying visions when he touches the sand, but Chani persuades him that they have no other option if they are to live, after riding a number of sandworms, the entire gang eventually heads south, Paul enters the temple and accepts the water of life from the keeper, which he promptly consumes, in a vision, he sees his future sister telling him the truth about their family, while they are standing on a beach, Paul's vitals are so low by the time the rest of the group gets to the temple, that he appears to be dead, Chani is enraged and tells Jessica that she ought to correct it, but Jessica manipulates Johnny with her power, so that she must complete the rite. In order to awaken Paul, Chani mixes a tiny bit of the water of life with her tear and applies the mixture to his lips. Everyone bows, believing this to be a miracle, but Chani gives Paul a slap before pouting and walking away. Paul then tells Jessica in private that he has the ability to look into the future and comprehend the past. In addition, he has discovered that Jessica is Vladimir's daughter and has seen his whole family tree. Jessica says that before she drank the water, she was unaware as well. Paul begins his descent from hero to tyrant when he declares that they will fight as them if they are Harkonnens. After that, Paul heads to the war council where Freeman leaders are praying. Although Chani tries to convince them that the prophecy is manipulating them and that things would not turn out well, no one finds her credible. The villagers debate whether Stilger should pass away, so Paul can assume the role of leader as Paul approaches the center of the space, but Paul scolds them for desiring to get rid of such a great fire. Then he gives a magnificent speech in which he introduces himself as a prophet and startles everyone by disclosing details about a stranger's background that he is only aware of because of the water. After being thoroughly impressed, everyone drops to their knees and acknowledges Paul as their permanent leader. Subsequently, Paul dons his father's ring once more, assuming the title of Duke of Arrakis, and vows to deliver a verdant paradise to the freemen. Chani is the only one not chanting his name as they prepare to defend him. Shortly after, Paul sends the Emperor a note challenging him to the throne. Helen confides in Irel and their family will continue to rule if Irel marries the winner, but that her father will lose the crown regardless of the outcome. The Emperor's army lands to Arrakis at a later date. Paul reminds the freshmen to capture the Emperor alive and works with them to create a plan. When he notices the arrival, Vladimir also tells Fade to alert the other great houses. Vladimir and his nephews are soon called before the Emperor, who demands information. Since Vladimir is ignorant of the events taking place in the south the emperor punishes Vladimir with a guard. The enemy's shields are destroyed by the atomic bombs as the freemen open fire and sand starts to blow around creating shelter. In order to slaughter hundreds of soldiers at once, they also set up a number of thumpers to call an army of worms which they ride directly into combat. In order to surround the opponent on all sides, a large number of freemen emerge from the sand as well and launch attacks from behind structures. The soldiers make an effort to fight back, but they are unprepared for the desert and will ultimately lose. The freemen soon enter the area and as they are defending the emperor, nobody seems to notice Paul as he moves through it. When Paul discovers Vladimir attempting to escape, he murders him and addresses him as grandfather. As he leaves, he orders the others to take everyone prisoner and give Vladimir's body to the desert. The fight continues for the next three hours, with the freemen obviously winning. In an attempt to flee, Reben is discovered by Gurney, who challenges him and quickly kills him in retaliation for the loss of his duke and companions. That evening, the fight comes to a conclusion, and all the bodies aside from Vladimir's, who is dumped into the sand are burned. Paul finds out the following morning that the big house's ships are hovering over them, ready to launch an assault. He gets Gurney to issue a warning threatening to destroy the spice field with their warheads if they don't respect his authority and assault him. Paul then declares that he would wed Ireland so that the two of them can rule together, but he demands an explanation from the emperor for the murder of his family. Since the emperor won't budge, he hands fate his sword and designates him to fight on his behalf. Paul addresses fate as cousin and the duel starts. The battle is fairly evenly matched between the two incredible fighters, but fate soon throws Paul to the ground and makes fun of him while referring to Chani as his pet. Paul doesn't give up and strikes again, allowing fate to knife him twice in a matter of seconds, but this was all a ruse by Paul, who had exposed himself in order to draw fate near and stab him fatally in the chest. Ireland is forced to approve the marriage and hand Paul the kingdom, as the freemen sing Paul's name. Everyone bows as Paul reaches out and forcibly kisses the emperor's ring. Distressed, Chani exits the room as Gurney tells them that the great houses have responded by promising to honor Paul. Paul finally gives Stilger the authority to transport the freemen to heaven. Instead of going with them, Chani heads to the desert in search of a worm to escape. 